Hey, Daryl. Uh, sometimes when we install strain gauges, we don't get the desired results. And, you know, human instinct, you know, the first thing we think of is, well, there's a fault with the strain gauge. Strain gauge isn't working. So, you know, when we're not getting the results that we want, what are some of the, the things that we should be double checking and going back to make sure we're doing right so that we get those accurate results? Hey, Mike, that's a, that's a great question. And in applications engineering, we see that uh, quite a bit. So what I'd like to do is go through some of the most common issues that we see relative to strain gauges. And just so that you know, it's not the sensor really that's potentially creating the problem. It could be something else. And some of these might be uh, obvious where some aren't so obvious. Uh, so let's start out, number one, and this is something we really emphasize as we uh, teach customers how to install gauges, is to remove the soldering flux. Uh, think of it like this. Whenever you're soldering on the strain gauges, flux is your friend. It, it's there to help you with getting the solder to wet to the tabs of the gauge and getting it to flow to the wires. But as soon as you're done, it's your enemy. And it's up to us to be able to, to make sure we get that flux removed because the flux is conductive and what's worse is that it changes with time. So oftentimes you'll find if you leave the flux on, it'll create a conductive path to the, the material that you got the gauge glued on. And over time, as it absorbs moisture, that, that conductivity increases and it creates a drift in the strain gauges. Uh, we've seen it on a regular basis with our customers. So it's, it's really a point of emphasis to make sure that once you're finished soldering, that you spend the time and use the right chemicals. We recommend using rosin solvent uh, to get that flux off. You know, it's my experience also, Daryl, that that flux over time is mildly corrosive, and it can actually etch through the gauge foil, creating, worst case, an open circuit. Um, I guess maybe that's not worst case. Worst case is bad data as opposed to no data. Yeah, that's... But it can cause, ultimately, failure of the gauge installation that, that can't be reversed by cleaning. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic point. So not only it leads to drift due to the conductive path to ground, but also it's an etchant. So it's etching away part of the metal. Uh, I've had customers that send gauges back before. When you look, under, look at them under high magnification, you actually see little green dots. And it's just like copper that you see outside that weathers. Uh, Constantan gauges are about half copper. And you can see the, the effects of that flux etching away at that copper because it turns green just like a copper awning is that's outside. So that's probably the number one thing and one of the number one areas that we're concerned about. Number two would be the uh, gauge installation practices. You know, what did you do to prep the surface and get it ready for uh, gauge installation? Uh, one, of the, one of the nice things about our company is that we provide a wealth of information about how to properly install the strain gauge, how to get the surface ready, how to go through the right handling of the strain gauges, as well as the proper curing of the adhesive system. You know, all of that information is well documented in our instruction bulletins and also well documented on our website. Um, number three I would look at is the um, the wiring connections to the instrument. Uh, it's a pretty regular basis that we find that customers will uh, either miswire uh, a strain gauge into their electronics or uh, now we find that um, we use a lot of RJ45 style connections with our data acquisition systems and sometimes they will uh, miswire it. It's an easy mistake to make. So rather than go and scrape your strain gauge off Take a few minutes and troubleshoot the pinouts on your connections that feed into your into your instrument. Can we talk a little bit about gauge bonding? I from time to time we'll see gauges that may have a tiny void under them. And being that the grid is an averaging device, if we've got 85 or 90 percent of the grid well bonded, can we kind of ignore that 10 to 20 percent that may may not be so well yeah, bonded? The short answer is no. You can't ignore it. The best thing you can do is scrape it off and start again. Uh, that's one of, the, one of the first things you do after getting the gauge installed is an optical inspection. And what you're looking for is did you get the gauge in the right location? Do you have the correct orientation? And also do you have any voids underneath it? And if you do see any signs of voids underneath the strain gauge, the best thing you can do is scrape it off and start over again. As painful as that is, 
in our view, no data is better than taking bad data. And I think we could all agree on that. Now, if, if there is a void under the gauge that maybe I can't see due to its location or poor lighting, what might that manifest itself as if I'm connected to an instrument and I'm trying to check it out electrically? If I have a void under the grid, what might I expect to see? Yeah, that's a great question, Jim. So the, the first thing we would look for is a zero return. Uh, so load the part, the structure, put some level of load or force on it, and then release it and see if it comes back to zero. Normally, strain gauges that have a void underneath it will not come back to zero. And typically, we're looking uh, at a zero return within just a few counts. Uh, second thing we look for is creep. And if you can put a load on it and hold it on there constant, does the output stay constant? And in general, gauges that are poorly bonded as you keep a constant load on them, they'll start to relax and they'll start to return back towards zero. And anything more than a, just a few counts out of a thousand that you see it returning back towards zero, that's, that should be a flag that goes up that creates a question mark on that gauge. And if you have a question mark on that gauge, no reason to move forward until you get that question mark resolved. Would it uh, have any influence over zero stability as well with no load? Absolutely. You can, a lot of times if you've got part of the grid that's not bonded, you excite it with a voltage, uh, you can see it start to self-heat. And there's also an old-timers trick um, where you take the gauge, you connect it to your electronics, and you take something soft like your fingertip or an eraser, and you push down on top of the gauge. And as you push down on top of the gauge, if there are voids underneath it or part of the gauge that's lifted, as you push down on it, you flatten it out. It creates a spike in the readings. It's hard to say quantitatively exactly what to look for, but in general, assuming you're not displacing the, the part that the gauge is mounted on, you're looking for somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 to 10, maybe 15 microstrain of change is pretty typical. But if you've got a void or part of it's not bonded, that it's going to be much higher than that. Typically, 75 to 100 microstrain may be higher. Got it. Uh, the next, uh, I guess, item to look at would be the, um, the input into your instrument of whether or not you're using the correct gauge factor and also if you're correcting for some of the common errors associated with strain gauge measurements like uh, transverse sensitivity. Uh, the gauge factor is published by us typically to a half a percent tolerance and if you're inputting that into a data acquisition system certainly you'd want to take that into account. Uh, some of our customers will ignore that and input a gauge factor of two but in general we don't recommend that. We'd recommend using the gauge factors found on the package uh, and also uh, you can have errors due to high transfer strains and you can correct for that as well because that transfer sensitivity is listed on the engineering data that comes with the gauges as well. <clears throat> Another potential source of error is using the wrong uh, shunt calibration resistor values. Uh, shunt calibration is a very important part, not so much of telling you how well the gauge is bonded, but scaling your electronics correctly. So you want to make sure that as you start to shunt calibrate that you've calculated what the simulated values are correctly and you're making those corrections either in your software or in your post-processing of the data. There's a table in our accessories catalog that shows recommended shunt values as well as what level of strain that these would simulate and in general it runs between about 500 microstrain up to about 10,000 and you've got values in between that you could use. Uh, next uh, that we look at is really the excitation level. Uh, you've got to be careful, especially if you're testing composites and plastics, about how much voltage you use to power the circuit. If you've got small size gauges on plastics, in general you're probably looking at about an excitation of 1 to 2 volts. If you go much higher than that, typically it will lead to drift. You might think it's the gauge, but really it's just that you're, you're overpowering the strain gauge and there's no place for the heat to go. On metals, it's not as common unless you've got some very small gauges or very low resistance or some kind of special considerations. Uh, next would be um, looking at strain levels that produce uh, yield in the structure. Uh, 
A lot of times when uh, we are checking for zero return and you load the structure and release it and it doesn't come back, you might start thinking there's a problem with the bond of the strain gauge, but also if you go to too high of a strain level, you get into the plastic deformation for that material and it's not going to return. So once you go past a proportional limit and then you release it, you're going to have some permanent offset. And that's really due to your loading of the material, not so much of the strain gauge and its installation. And then working down through here, um, continuing on, applying strain levels that are beyond the capability of the strain gauge or the adhesive. Uh, this is going to be well documented in our catalogs for both the gauges and the adhesive system. Uh, but you may find applications where maybe you get surprised and you're expecting relatively moderate to low strains and all of a sudden you've got something that's very high. Maybe it's a burst test or you start pulling a material well beyond its normal limits. And um, in general, you're going to find this information is well documented. And if you follow the procedures as we have outlined in our instruction bulletins for gauge installation, that for most applications, the gauges and adhesives will meet the criteria as it's outlined. There are some exceptions to that, but for the most part, it'll meet those, those specs as found in the catalogs and the instruction bulletins. And then last, almost last but not least, we've got um, applying strain gauges to bolted assemblies. Uh, in particular, whenever you're dealing with high precision transducers, um, assembly stresses, bolted connections uh, can lead to things like non-zero return. And oftentimes the, the gauge gets the blame, but the reality of it is just the nature of the way that that part is behaving. So in general, when we're talking about transducers, we try to keep bolted connections some distance away from where you're actually measuring the strain. For a simple cantilever beam, for example, usually we try to stay two beam widths away from the end where it gets clamped, and that helps to get us into a uniform strain field so we get good performance and good uh, zero return. And then last but not least is not applying the correct protective coatings. Uh, uh, this is a big one. So if you've got an application that's going to go outside, you really need to spend some time evaluating and determining what's going to be the right protective coating to keep the contamination away from the gauge site. You know, you're taking essentially a, an electrically sensitive grid, placing it in an outdoor environment, and moisture has infinite patience. So it's really up to us to try to protect it from that moisture, uh, protect it from that humidity, or what else might be in that environmental condition with your strain gauge. The good news is that we have a wide variety of different types of environmental coatings to choose from. Everything from polyurethanes to silicone rubber uh, to polysulfides to butyl rubber. And you really just have to look at these environmental coatings and weigh them out and decide which one's going to be the best one and which one's going to fit your application. And if you have any questions about that sort of selection, just pick up the phone and call us. We've got our applications engineers that would be happy to, to help you address these types of questions and go through the different environmental coatings and help you select the right one. Thanks, Daryl. That's uh, an awful lot of information. So I guess uh, the moral of the story is pay attention to the details and before you blame the gauge, go back through the checklist to make sure that you're, you're doing all of these items right because any one of them or combination of them can uh, have a serious effect on your outcome. That's exactly right, Mike. Great point. And again, if you do have questions, feel free to reach out to us either by email or by phone. Uh, also take a look at our website. It's www.micro-measurements.com. We've got a lot of good technical information there. And also you can visit the strain blog at www.strainblog.com. There's a lot of good articles and photographs as well as uh, uh, video related to strain gauge ins installations and the kind of things to watch out for.